We have a word in our English language we use to describe horrendous pain. It's the word excruciating. Excruciating, ex, the prefix means out of. Crux, Latin for cross. Literally, excruciating means out of the cross. The physical pain associated with, with crucifixion was so horrible that a word had to be invented to describe it. Out of the cross came horrendous pain, but out of the cross also came our salvation. And that's the truth we're going to see in our final message from the Gospel of Luke. If you have your Bibles, I want you to turn to Luke chapter 22. Luke 22, we are now in the final 15 hours of Jesus' life before his crucifixion. Jesus would go through six different trials before his crucifixion at 9 a.m. Friday morning. Three of those trials were religious trials. Three of them were civil trials by the Romans. Now, I've heard this all of my life, as you have, but it really wasn't until this week that I came to understand why he had to go through so many trials, why there was a religious trial and then a civil trial. The Jews wanted to get rid of Jesus. Their charge against him was blasphemy. Now, the problem with this is the Jews live in occupied territory. Rome was in charge, and only Rome had the right to take a life, to execute capital punishment. So in order to crucify Jesus, there had to be a different set of charges to convict Jesus and make him worthy of capital punishment. And those charges would not be blasphemy, they would be treason, an insurrection trying to rival the kingdom of the emperor Tiberius. That's why there were two different sets of trials, the religious trials and then the civil trials. Let's look first at the religious trials. Luke twenty-two fifty-four says, after arresting Jesus, they carried him and brought him to the house of the high priest. Now, we saw last time, the high priest at the time of Jesus' trial was a man named Caiaphas. Now, Caiaphas's predecessor, right before him, was his father-in-law, Annas. He had just been the high priest. They thought they could get a quick conviction that Annas would come up with a way in order to charge Jesus. It didn't work out the way they thought it would. Jesus didn't give them the testimony they wanted. So even though that was the first trial, Jesus before Annas, it was inconsequential. And that moves to the second trial of Jesus, Jesus before Caiaphas. They take Jesus away from Annas. They go across the courtyard where Peter was out waiting to see what was going to happen. And he stands before Caiaphas, the current high priest. Now, we don't have a record in Luke of what happened at that trial. But Mark tells us in Mark 14. So hold your place here and turn to Mark 14, beginning with verse, let's say, 57. And some stood up, and they began to give false testimony against Jesus, saying, We heard him say, I will destroy this temple made with hands, and in three days I will build another made without hands. And not even in this respect was their testimony consistent. And the high priest stood up and came forward and questioned Jesus, saying, Do you make no answer? What is it that these men are testifying against you? But Jesus kept silent and made no answer. Again, the high priest was questioning him and saying to him, Are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed One? And Jesus said, I am. And then to add injury to insult, he quotes a verse from Daniel chapter 7 about the Messiah. He says, And you shall see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of power and coming with clouds of heaven. That's all Caiaphas needed to hear. And tearing his clothes, the high priest said, What further need do we have of witnesses? You have heard the blasphemy. How does it seem to you? And they all condemned him to be deserving of death. 
They then took him from the house of Caiaphas for the third and final trial, the religious trial, and that is Jesus before the Sanhedrin. Many people don't understand about the Sanhedrin. Every village, every town had a Sanhedrin, a ruling council to settle disputes. But then there was the great Sanhedrin, that is the Supreme Court of Israel, that consisted of about 70 individuals who would hear the most complicated and controversial cases. And so they assembled together as many of the Sanhedrin as they could get together on short notice. And they asked him the question, are you the Messiah? Verse 67, and he said to them, if I tell you, you will not believe. And if I ask a question, you will not answer. Why should I even bother to answer you? You don't want the truth. But then he relented and he went ahead and answered. Verse 69. But from now on, the Son of Man will be seated at the right hand of the power of God. That is a quotation of Psalm 110, verse 1. Another messianic psalm. Jesus was saying, one day you will see me seated before the right hand of God the Father. Now that was blasphemy. That a mere man says, I will be seated at the right hand of a transcendent God. That's all they needed to hear. They ask again, though, verse 70, make sure they had it right. Are you the Son of God then? And Jesus again said to them, yes, I am. And they said, what further need do we have of testimony? For we have heard it ourselves from his own mouth. The Jews convicted him of blasphemy. But remember, the Romans, who had the power to carry out a capital sentence, they couldn't care less about blasphemy. So these Jewish leaders, knowing that, had to trump up some charges that would get Rome's attention. And that's what you see happening when they bring Jesus to Pilate. Now the job of a governor was twofold. To keep order, and he was given a military to do that, and secondly, to collect taxes. That's all Rome wanted to do, keep order and collect the taxes. Pilate had a very tenuous relationship with Rome. Pilate was extremely anti-Semitic. He hated the Jews. No, Rome didn't care about that. But because he was so anti-Semitic, he took six aggressive, offensive actions toward the Jews that got them all stirred up and caused so many insurrections. So because of his tenuous uh, relationship with Rome, Pilate wanted to make sure there were no more insurrections. And that gives you a background to understand why this whole situation of Jesus was such a sticky issue. Look at verse 2 for a moment. Notice the charge they trumped up against Jesus. They began to accuse Jesus, saying, we found this man misleading our nation. And doing what? Forbidding to pay taxes to Caesar and saying that he himself is Christ. Now, was that true? The opposite was true. They had tried to trick Jesus, saying, is it rightful to pay taxes to Caesar? Jesus holds up the coin and says, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God. So that was an outright lie. Then they say, not only that, he's saying that he himself is a king. That is, he's going to set up a kingdom and try to topple that of Tiberius Caesar. Look at verse 3. So Pilate asked Jesus, saying, Are you the king of the Jews? And he answered him and said, It is as you say. And Pilate said to the chief priests and the multitudes, I find no fault. I find no guilt in this man. Why not? He had just claimed to be a king. Yet as Pilate looked at Jesus, he didn't see anything threatening there. This guy's a king. He couldn't rule himself out of a paper sack. There's no threat here. Let him go. Let's be done with this. Verse 5, but they kept on insisting, saying, he stirs up the people, teaching all over Judea, starting from Galilee, even as far as this place. But when Pilate heard it, he asked whether the man was a Galilean. And when he learned that he belonged to Herod's jurisdiction, he sent him to Herod, who himself was also in Jerusalem at this time. As soon as Pilate heard that Jesus was from Galilee, 
Pilate said, man, I'm off the hook on this one. If he's from Galilee in the north, that's not my jurisdiction. I'm going to let Herod handle the matter. After all, Herod's in town too for the Passover. Let's get rid of this and let Herod uh, deal with Jesus. And so they take Jesus before Herod Antipas. Look in verses 11 and 12. And Herod with his soldiers, after treating him with contempt and mocking him, dressed him in a gorgeous robe and sent him back to Pilate. This was a joke to Herod. He said, let's have a little fun with Jesus. We'll put a robe around him, put a scepter in his hand, put a crown on his head and send him back to my rival Pilate and say, thanks, but no thanks. You handle this. He sends him back to Pilate. And that begins the final trial of Jesus. We're now at about 7.30 on Friday morning before the crucifixion at 9 o'clock. Remember, Pilate is at the praetorium. He's probably holding the trial outside in the courtyard because it's not just the Sanhedrin there. It's the throngs of Jews who are there too to listen to this. Look at verse 13. And Pilate summoned the chief priest and the rulers and the people and said to them, you brought this man to me as one who incites the people to rebellion. And behold, having examined him before you, I have found no guilt in this man regarding the charges which you make against him. No, nor has Herod, for he's sending him back to us. And behold, nothing deserving death has been done by him. I therefore will punish him and release him. We'll give him a flogging and that'll be the end of it. Not according to the people, they would have none of that. Every year at Passover, the Romans showed their respect for the Jewish people by releasing one of their prisoners. Pilate thought, surely this could take care of the Jesus matter. He said, remember the custom? I get to release one prisoner. Surely you want me to release Jesus, don't you? Look at verse 18. But they cried out all together, saying, away with this man and release for us Barabbas. He was one who had been thrown into prison for a certain insurrection made in the city and for murder. Here is a man who is actually guilty of trying to topple the Roman Empire. But Pilate, wanting to release Jesus, addressed them again. But they kept on calling out, saying, crucify, crucify him. And he said to them the third time, why, what evil has this man done? I found in him no guilt demanding death. I will therefore punish him and release him. Pilate was beginning to sense something's wrong here. I mean, after all, if Jesus was really guilty of leading an insurrection against Rome, shouldn't the Jewish people be coronating him instead of wanting to crucify him? That's what they wanted, a political leader who would lead a rebellion. Why are they so angry against Jesus? They were insistent, and finally Pilate had had enough, verse 24, and Pilate pronounced the sentence that their demand should be granted, and he released the man that they were asking for who had been thrown into prison for insurrection and murder, but he delivered Jesus to their will. Barabbas was the one intended to die that day. The one who was truly guilty. But they released him and sentenced Jesus to the cross. And that leads to the crucifixion of Jesus. Beginning in verse 33, we find the description of the crucifixion of Jesus. These are truly holy words. And when they came to the place called the skull, there they crucified him. And the criminals, one on the right and the other on the left. But Jesus was saying, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they cast lots, dividing up his garments among themselves. And the people stood by looking on. And even the rulers were sneering at him, saying, he saved others. Let him save himself, if this is the Christ of God, his chosen one. And the soldiers also mocked him, coming up to him, offering him sour wine, and saying, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. Now there was also an inscription above him, 
This is the king of the Jews. And one of the criminals who was hanged there was hurling abuse at him, saying, Are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other answered, rebuking him, and said, Do you not even fear God, since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we are receiving what we deserve for our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. And he was saying, Jesus, remember me when you come in your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, truly I say to you, today you shall be with me in paradise. And it was now about the sixth hour, and darkness fell over the whole land until the ninth hour. The sun being obscured, and the veil of the temple was torn in two. And Jesus, crying out with a loud voice, said, Father, into thy hands I commit my spirit. And having said this, he breathed his last. That's the death. Jesus died. And as horrendous, as excruciating as that physical pain was, it was nothing compared to the spiritual pain he experienced of bearing the sins of the world, of bearing your sins and my sins, experiencing something he had never experienced before, separation from God his Father. As I said earlier, the one man who could appreciate the idea of Jesus dying in his place more than any other person in history was a prisoner named Barabbas. In his book, The Darkness and the Dawn, Chuck Swindoll explains what that morning must have been like for Barabbas, the insurrectionist who had been sentenced to die on a cross. Most likely, Barabbas was being held in Antonio's fortress, where many of us have been, about a half a mile away from the praetorium where Pilate and Jesus were. Because of the distance, it was impossible for Barabbas to hear the conversation between Pilate and Jesus. But Barabbas could very well hear the yelling of the crowd. Barabbas could not hear Pilate ask the question to the crowd, whom should I release today, Jesus or Barabbas? But what Barabbas did hear was the cry of the crowd, Barabbas, Barabbas, Barabbas. As Barabbas sat in that cold cell and heard his name being shouted, hope began to build up in his heart. Maybe my fellow Jews are going to join me in the insurrection. Maybe they're forming a mob. Maybe they're going to come and release me. But Barabbas couldn't hear the next question Pilate asked. He asked the crowd, then what shall I do with Jesus? But Barabbas could hear the reply of the crowd. Crucify him! Crucify him! Crucify him! Now think about it. Barabbas is alone in that cell a half mile away, and all he can hear the crowd shouting is, Barabbas, 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 crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. Barabbas soon realized this wasn't a rescue party. This was a lynching mob. His heart began to beat faster as he heard the steps of those Roman soldiers against the stone pavement coming closer and closer and closer until that burly Roman centurion confronted Barabbas, threw open the prison door and said, Barabbas, get your stuff together. Barabbas gulped, but then he heard words he never expected to hear. Get out of here. You're free today. For on that cross, meant for Barabbas, someone else, someone innocent would die in his place, the Lord Jesus Christ, just as he died for you and for me. The Bible says God made him Jesus Christ. 
who knew no sin to be sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him. How can we ever thank God enough for what he has done for us? The most important job of any parent is leading his children to Christ. But most parents have no idea how to do that. That's why I've written my brand new book for you, your children, and your grandchildren. The Gift, The Gospel for Children, a brand new full-color book by Dr. Robert Jeffress. It's yours when you give a generous gift to Pathway to Victory. This is a book you can give to your children to read on their own, or you can go through it with them. At the end of the book is a prayer of salvation they can pray to trust in Christ as their Savior. In 64 beautifully illustrated pages, The Gift explains the gospel message in a way that children can understand and invites them to begin a relationship with Jesus Christ. It comes with a bonus DVD from Dr. Jeffress with messages for both you and your child. Don't wait until it's too late. Help your child or grandchild make the most important decision they'll ever make in life, the decision to trust in Jesus Christ. Request my brand new book, The Gift, and the bonus DVD today. The psalmist said, Sorrow endures the night, but joy comes in the morning. Perhaps you've experienced that yourself. You know what it's like to go through a difficult night that seems like it would never, never end. There is something about nighttime, something about the darkness that intensifies whatever struggle we're experiencing. Today, we're going to look at the longest night in Jesus' entire life. A night in which he experienced temptation, betrayal by somebody close to him, and the abandonment by everyone he trusted in. If you have your Bibles, I want you to turn to Luke chapter 22 as we talk about Jesus' longest night. Luke chapter 22. Now, in our more than year-long study of the Gospel of Luke, we've come to the final week in Christ's life, and we are now on Thursday night before the crucifixion that would occur just hours later. And remember, Jesus had gathered his disciples in that upper room to celebrate the Passover meal, and it was that departure from that upper room that set the stage for the first of three trials Jesus would experience that night. First of all, the temptation he would experience. Look at verse 39. And he came out, that is, of the upper room, and proceeded, as was his custom, to the Mount of Olives. And the disciples also followed him. Many of us have made that journey from the upper room uh, down through Jerusalem, across the Kidron Valley, up to the Mount of Olives. Now, the Garden of Olive Trees that Jesus and his disciples went to, Matthew and Mark tells us, was called Gethsemane. And Gethsemane is a Hebrew word that literally means to press. It refers to the pressing of olives to make olive oil. But it also would refer to the great press that Jesus would feel that night as he struggled with the will of God. Look at verse 40. And when Jesus arrived at the place, he said to them, pray that you might not enter into temptation. That night, Jesus' disciples were going to be tempted to deny the Lord, and they failed that test. But Jesus was going to face his own temptation, a temptation to disobey the will of his heavenly Father. And fortunately for us, Jesus passed that test with flying colors. Now notice this, verse 41. And he withdrew from them, that is the disciples, about a stone's throw, and he knelt down and began to pray. Now that's an unfortunate translation, knelt down 
down. If you want to find out what really happened, go to Matthew 26, verses 38 and 39. This isn't a contradictory account. It is a fuller account of what happened. Verse 20, 38 of Matthew 26, Then Jesus said to them, My soul is deeply grieved to the point of death. Remain here and keep watch with me. Verse 39, And he went a little beyond them, and he fell on his face. That is, he collapsed. He was so weighed down with a burden that he couldn't walk any further. He fell down on his face and began to pray, saying, Father, if it is possible... Let this cup pass from me, yet not as I will, but as thou wilt. Let this cup pass from me. What did he mean by that? I think he was asking God to exempt him from the physical suffering of the cross and the spiritual suffering of the cross. You say, wait a minute, preacher, that doesn't make any sense. You just said Jesus knew that's why he was coming, to suffer physically and spiritually. Why then would he pray to be delivered from that experience if he knew that was God's will? Let me ask you something. Have you ever known what God wanted you to do in a particular situation and you struggled with doing it? That was Jesus. You see, Jesus was fully God, but he was also fully man. And it was only natural that he would ask for another way to accomplish the Father's will. And that's why he said, Father, if you can, find another way for me to accomplish your mission. Notice verse 43 and verse 44. Now an angel from heaven appeared to him, strengthening him. And being in agony, he was praying very fervently, and his sweat became like drops of blood falling down upon the ground. Jesus, the Son, and God, the Father, are one. I and the Father are one. And yet that night in the garden, there is a struggle between the will of the Son and the will of the Father. I don't understand it, but I know this. When you and I struggle with doing God's will, God understands that because he's experienced it. Not my will, Father, but your will be done. Jesus struggled with that. But God's will ultimately won. And when Jesus settled that matter in his own heart, he got up with confidence to face the cross. And that set up the stage for the greatest betrayal he would ever experience. Look at verse 47 of Luke 22. While Jesus was still speaking, Behold, a multitude came, and the one called Judas, one of the twelve, was preceding them. And he approached Jesus to kiss him. But Jesus said to him, Judas, are you betraying the Son of Man with a kiss? Remember, Jesus had left the Last Supper early in the upper room. Once he knew the game plan for the rest of the evening and where Jesus was going, he went off to tell the Jewish officials so that they could come and arrest him by night. Verse 49 and when those who were around Jesus saw what was going to happen, they said, Lord, shall we strike with the sword? Well, there was one overzealous apostle who didn't wait for the answer. Look at verse 50. And a certain one of them struck the slave of the high priest and cut off his right ear. That certain one, John 18 tells us, was Peter. Now, to see what Jesus' response to that was, hold your place here and turn over to the parallel passage, Matthew 26, verses 52 to 56. Then Jesus said to Peter, put your sword back into its place. For all those who take up the sword shall perish by the sword. Now, don't read into that more than ought to be read into it. What Jesus is simply saying here is, you're not going to advance the kingdom of God by physical force. There is no justification for a Christian jihad, okay? There are other faiths that say, we're going to use the power of the sword to convert people to our way of thinking, not Christianity. It is the power of the Holy Spirit of God that changes people's lives, not physical force. He's simply saying, 
my purpose is not going to be fulfilled through the use of the sword. He goes on to say, for do you not think that I could appeal to my father? And he will at once put at my disposal more than 12 legions of angels. Do you remember in the Old Testament, just one angel slew 185,000 Assyrian soldiers. Imagine what 72,000 angels could do. But then he goes on to say, but how then shall the scriptures be fulfilled that it must happen this way? Jesus said, Peter, put the sword away. This is part of God's plan for my life. You know, Judas' betrayal had to have been very painful for the Lord to experience. The disciples, these 12 men had become like his family for three years. He'd eaten almost every meal with them. He had laughed with them, cried with them, shared his innermost thoughts, and then to have one sell him out for 30 pieces of silver. As we've said before, Jesus could have been consumed with bitterness if he had focused on that offense. But Jesus was saying to Peter, Peter, leave him alone. Leave these people alone. They are simply pawns on God's chessboard to accomplish his ultimate plan. That's what Jesus was saying. And then notice how Matthew 26 verse 56 ends. Then all the disciples left him and fled. It wasn't just Judas who betrayed him. All the disciples left him and fled. And in that word all was included one man that you would least expect to turn his back and run. His name was Peter. And Peter in a few hours time would deny the Lord not once, twice, but three times. Turn back to Luke 22 for just a moment. Remember just a few hours earlier in the upper room, Peter had made this bold declaration. He said in verse 33, Lord, with you I am ready to go to prison and to death. And Jesus said, I say to you, Peter, the cock will not crow today until you had denied three times that you even know me. Now, he made that prediction in the upper room. Just an hour or so later in the Garden of Gethsemane, what happened? <laughs> Peter took the sword and cut that guy's ear off. And you were tempted to think, well, maybe Jesus was wrong about this. Maybe Peter was going to be the rock man that Jesus said he was. But the rock man turned to jelly very quickly. Notice verse 54 of Luke 22. And having arrested Jesus, they led him away and brought him to the house of the high priest. But Peter was following at a distance. There's a whole sermon in that phrase. Peter was following at a distance. There are a lot of followers of Christ today who profess they're going to do great things for God. But when the heat starts to be turned up on them for following Jesus, they drop back a little bit. There's a distance between them and the Lord until they see how this is all really going to pan out. That was Peter. As he began to see everything taking place, he drops back. He's still curious, but he drops back. Now, where did they take Jesus from the garden? To the house of the high priest. And Jesus begins at about 1 o'clock in the morning, a series of six trials before he was crucified eight hours later at 9 a.m. Now, Peter was with the others out in the courtyard of that high priest's home where he could hear everything that was taking place. Now, notice the three denials that would take place within these two hours. Verse 55, and after they had kindled a fire in the middle of the courtyard and had sat down together, Peter was sitting among them. And a certain servant girl, seeing him as he sat in the firelight and looking intently at him, said, this man was with him, Jesus too. But he denied it, saying, woman, I do not know him. Notice the two-step denial. He denied it, but then he went further. He said, I don't even know him. The first denial. The second denial, an hour or so later perhaps, verse 58. And a little later, another saw him and said, you are one of them too. But Peter said, man, I am not. Notice here, Peter's not only denying that he knew Jesus, he was denying the disciples as well, that he was part of them. He said, I'm not a part of that group whatsoever. And then the third denial, perhaps 30 minutes or so later in verse 59, somebody else fixes their gaze on Peter and insisted, 
certainly this man also was with him, for he is a Galilean too. Remember, Galileans lived in the north. Jesus was from Galilee. Now, how did he know that Peter was from Galilee simply by looking at him? The Galileans had a certain accent. Those in the south knew exactly where he was from. And so how did he respond to that? Matthew's account says he began to, quote, curse and swear. Now, I've read that for years, and you have too. And I bet you've had the same thought I did. You probably think that means that Peter responded by just letting out a string of expletives, cursing and swearing. And he was swearing an oath, may God strike me dead. May God send me to hell if I am not telling the truth that I don't know who he is. That's what you call the ultimate denial. Verse 60 says, before those words had left Peter's mouth, the rooster crowed just as the Lord had predicted. And the Lord, who was apparently close by, turned around and simply stared at Peter. And those eyes of Jesus, those eyes that Revelation 1 describes as like fire, those eyes of Jesus burned into Peter's heart. And Peter immediately remembered the Lord's prediction before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. Verse 62 says, And Peter went out, and he wept bitterly, continually. What a night it had been for the Lord. In just a few hours, an intense temptation to disobey God. The betrayal by somebody close to him. The abandonment of everyone close to him, including Peter. Obviously, these events are important because they were the preamble to the crucifixion that we'll look at next time. But in these final moments we have today, I want to point out just three simple principles from this passage that I hope will be an encouragement to you when you face temptation, betrayal, abandonment of those close to you. Number one, write this down. Don't be surprised when people disappoint you. Don't be surprised when people disappoint you. You know, Judas' betrayal could have been written off as simply an anomaly. I mean, Judas, I mean, he was not a Christian to begin with. Okay, we'll give him some slack. But then for all of the disciples to abandon him. And then for Peter, the one Jesus had handpicked to be the leaders, that was a hard thing to take. But Jesus never wavered in his faith because his faith was not in people. His ultimate faith was in God. And ours should be as well. Don't put your hope in other people. Principle number two, strengthen your relationship with God before the battle begins. Strengthen your relationship with God before the battle begins. You know, the baseball player who waits until the World Series to learn how to swing a bat. The soldier who waits until the bullets are firing, flying overhead until he learns how to load a gun. Uh, th those men have waited too late. No, the key to success in the game is what you do in preparation away from the game. You know, so many times we hear it said, well, if you want to be a good Christian and succeed in temptation and testing in your life, you know, ask yourself, what would Jesus do? Try to be like Jesus. Try to do what he did when he was in the garden or when he